to the We Seek Wisdom podcast. So glad you're joining us for another episode. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to click that subscription button you'll find below the video and also click on the like and then share this podcast with others. Well, Dr. Garlock, what are we talking about this week? I want to begin our discussion today with a comparison to a book that I've already had in my library for a long time. I taught trombone to one of the author's sons of over 50 years ago. <laughs> wow. I knew the other author personally, even led a singing in a conference where he and I were two of the old men. We were both <laughs> in our 70s. Mm -hmm. One of them was Lee Robertson of Tennessee Temple, mm -hmm. and the other was uh, 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 another old man, John Whitcomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, did, we were the three main speakers in this conference. Yeah, okay. and I, I remember commenting, here we are all 70 years old or over 70s, and here are old men talking. <laughs> the book to which I'm referring to is called The Genesis Flood. Two outstanding scholars, Henry Morris and John Whitcomb, co-authored this book that has been in 49 printings and 300,000 copies have wow. been distributed. Wow. This is significant for a book that has seven chapters that cover 48, 40, 480, I can't even say it, 488 pages uh -huh. and two appendices with detailed scientific facts based on the infallible Word of God. Yes. A quote from page Roman numeral 18 of this book gives a comparison that I would like to imprecisely apply to what Frank Garlock and I have been talking about here. During the decade of the 1950s, Dr. Morris and Whitcomb, uh, Dr. Whitcomb as well, fine-tuned their thoughts into what would become the 1961 release of The Genesis Flood, the book that Dr. Garlock was just talking about. These serious Christians would be hard to find, each absolutely committed to the Lord and His Word. This task at hand necessitated both men involved in it. Yeah, there are some projects that take two men. Yes. I think that's in God's providence that he's brought you and me together, mm -hmm. Dr. Willingham. And our abilities are the same in some areas, mm -hmm. but they're different in other areas. And mm -hmm. God knew that. Right, right. He knew that before you and I were born. <laughs> yes. So he's going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Willingham and I have delved into an area of music, and especially Christian music, mm -hmm. that has been neglected for a long time. It's been practiced by many competent and proficient composers, but it has never been dissected and explained by applying phonics to music mm -hmm. with phonomusicology and particularly phonohymnology. Mm -hmm. These two terms have come about in our relationship through our training, our research, and our many years of teaching what is called music theory. I think it should be called music practice, but that's yes. beside yes. the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this application of such a significant aspect of music that has been ignored and neglected opens up new vistas of understanding and comprehension of the relationship between the music and the lyrics that it enhances through an understanding of musical archetypes that it utilizes. Mm -hmm. We have referenced the over 600 times music is mentioned in the Bible as a foundation to our studies to demonstrate the lack of understanding even among Christians. Today, we will apply what we've talk, been talking about from Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. In showing the problems that television has caused in this generation, Postman coincidentally refers to music as one of its contributing factors to the decline of culture in America. So we're going to, going to begin, actually, in Neil Postman's book, mm -hmm. on page Roman numeral 19. Mm -hmm. And here's what Postman said. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. He feared it would become a trivial culture with some equivalent to the feelies. <clears throat> Television musicians spend more time with their hair dryers than with their music. <laughs> Form excludes content. Mm -hmm. You cannot have rich doctrinal hymns on television. Its form works against the content. Mm -hmm. On page 8, Neil Postman 
is quoting, he says, you cannot have scriptural words. With, that's my application. Mm -hmm. Because two media so vastly different cannot accommodate the same ideas. Mm -hmm. Page 22. When rock music tries to portray the almighty God of the universe, then here's Neil Postman. God appears to have been the loser. Mm -hmm. And then on page 22, he says, Truth does not and never has come unadorned. Mm -hmm. It must appear in its proper clothing or it is not acknowledged, yes. end quote. This is why the understanding of a phonohymnology is so meaningful. Yes, and he goes on on page 32 to say, the gospel may be driven forward in books other than the Bible, as, for example, in the famous Bay Psalm book, printed way back in 1640, and generally regarded as America's bestseller. Then on page 43, Postman even quotes Karl Marx as saying, quote, with the emergence of the press, the singing and the telling of the muse cease. Isn't that interesting? Even Karl mm -hmm. Marx mm -hmm. recognized what was going on with music. Mm -hmm. Postman refers, this is in page 47, Postman refers to camp meetings as centers for oratory, mm -hmm. but he neglects the fact that Chautauqua, New York, Ocean Grove, New Jersey, Bayview, Michigan, and June, Alaska, North Carolina, were all centers for outstanding Christian music as well. Mm, good. On page 49, he says, One must begin, I think, by pointing out the obvious fact that well-written Christian music and an oratory based upon it has a content, a systematic, paraphrased, propositional content. And then we apply that to say when the content is ignored, the music loses its power. Then on page 86, I apply again, to, we're applying this to our music. Music mm -hmm. of today's Christian music mm -hmm. requires minimal squills to comprehend it and is largely aimed at emotional gratification. Yes. That's Neil Postman's term. Mm -hmm. Even commercials, both secular and religious these days, are exquisitely crafted and accompanied by exciting music. Those yes. are Toast Postman's words again. Mm -hmm. And he also says on the next page, page 87, everything about a new show tells us this, the good looks of the cast, their pleasant banter, and the exciting music that open and closes the show are a format for entertainment. Even the news show is trying to be entertaining. Yes. Postman said almost all television programs are embedded in the music, which helps to tell the audience what emotions are to be called forth, end quote. Mm -hmm. On page 94, he says, as reported with great enthusiasm, the Philadelphia public schools have embarked on an experiment in which children will have their curriculum sung to them. Wearing Walkman equipment, students are shown right parts of speech listening to rock music. They are planning to delight students further by subjecting math and history as well as English to the rigors of music format. Hmm. The Philadelphia Experiment aims to make the classroom itself into a rock concert. Wow. Yeah. Then on pages 118 and 119, Postman says there are several characteristics of television and its surroundings that converge to make authentic religious experience impossible. If an audience is not immersed in an aura of mystery and symbolic otherworldliness, then it is unlikely that it can call forth the state of mind required for a non-trivial religious experience, mm. end quote. And I say this is an insightful glimpse of many church services and their music for the last decades from 2010 to 2022. Yeah, that's yeah, unfortunate. On page 121, Postman says, Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it's delivered with sensual rock music, it is another kind of religion altogether. Wow. From Neil Postman. Mm -hmm. And then on pages 122 and 123, he says, Postman says, entertainment is the means to which we distance ourselves from sacredness. Mm -hmm. 
The Christian rock singer, although God's name is invoked repeatedly, the concreteness and persistence of the image of the singer carries the clearer message that it is he, not God, who must be worshipped. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, Postman says, the word for this is blasphemy. Yes, it is. Wow. Yes, it is. On the next page, 124, he says, There is no doubt that religion can be made entertaining. The question is, by doing so, do we destroy it? And does the popularity of religion as a vaudeville show, by adding rock music to it, turn it into a manic and trivial display? As Hannah Ardent would say, that is the problem, not the solution. Oh, another great quote. Now, Christian music that attempts to use sensual music with scriptural ideas. The music gains the upper hand with its anti-scriptural message and spiritual death is the result. When a people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. Cultural death is a near possibility. And on page 156, he continues by saying, but what if there are no cries of anguish to be heard? Who is prepared to take arms against a sea of amusement? To whom do we complain? And when? And in what tone of voice? When serious discourse dissolves into giggles? And then my application to what you just quoted from Neil Postman, Mm -hmm. Dr. Willingham, is when a church becomes an audience Mm -hmm. and its public services a vaudeville act, then the church finds itself at risk and spiritual death is a clear possibility. Mm -hmm. With my application, this is why we need to speak against the trend and provide an alternative solution. We believe that phono-hymnology is a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. It's so great to dig into the principles of what made this music great and why it's substantive, why it should be used. Because you go to church and it's it's like you would go to a steakhouse and order a six-ounce filet and they bring you out six ounces of cotton candy. Yeah. And then you leave the service and you're like, did I just waste my time? I came here to worship. That that there was no substance here. And we we need that substance in our churches and, and not Amen. to shy away from it. Good Tim. On pages 157 and 158, Dr. Postman goes on to say, What is happening in America is not the design of an articulated ideology, but it is an ideology nonetheless. What we have is what Postman says next. Here is theology without words, and all the more powerful for their absence. Our study reveals that unless the music matches the inspired words and sensual contemporary Christian music contradicts biblical theology, the context causes the words to take on a contradictory meaning from what the Bible actually teaches. Wow. Or that... What we just read was powerful, coming from a secular man who taught at New York University and wrote the book, and now he has a new copy out. If you want another copy of the book, there's mm-hmm. a new copy of it. Oh, there's a new And it yeah. even has no postman's son mm-hmm. in the introduction saying, his, wow, his dad knew what was going on, and mm-hmm. people criticized him for it, mm-hmm. but he was willing to stand up for it. And I think... That's what you and I are doing, Tim. Mm-hmm. We're standing up against the trend is that in our churches, where so many churches have become a volatile act, yeah. it's all just entertainment. Yeah. And yeah. the people go home with no content. Yeah. And there's no repentance. And there's, I mean, it's just, that's where we are. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're saying, you got to go back because the hymns we're giving you and, and analyzing are showing the content that needs to be there and it's not only in the words Mm -hmm. it's in the music itself good good excellent points 